Hello, and welcome to our study of First Corinthians. You'll remember the last time we were together, we were looking at chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, and just about everybody knows that's the love chapter. As we look at it, it is evident that this chapter is basically saying love is the heart, that Christianity without love is, is heartless, really, and it's not doing what God wants it to do. Then I would suggest that God is its greatest display. We looked at some of the things that, that love is, like love is long-suffering, for example. Well, God is long-suffering. He is the greatest example of being long-suffering. Uh, love uh, doesn't think anything evil. It, it wants only the best for the object of its love. And again, God is the greatest display of that. So chapter 13 helped us to see that. Then we observe that miracles will come to an end, uh, that yes, they had a purpose. And we're going to talk more about that purpose in chapter 14. Uh, but that purpose would one day be fulfilled or completed. And at that point, miracles would come to an end. Tongues would cease naturally because there'd be no one left to cause someone to be able to speak in tongues miraculously. And then the closing idea of the chapter is love abides. Everything else may pass away, and in fact will. Um, even faith and hope will be done away with in heaven. We won't need faith anymore because we will actually see God face to face. Hope won't need that either because we'll already possess our hope. So that summarizes chapter 13. It sets up perfectly for what will follow in the next chapter. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun, heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. All right. We remember that beginning with really chapter 12 and going all the way through chapter 14, Paul is dealing with a significant problem in Corinth, in the church. And that problem is these miraculous gifts and the view that the various members had of those gifts. So chapter 14 is wrapping all this up and it's doing so in a fashion that will cause us to realize what the proper use of those gifts was really intended to be. So let's look together at verses one and following. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. The word pursue there is a present imperative. So it's a command, but it's more than that. It's an active command. Keep on doing it. Don't ever stop in the hunt, as it were. Well, what are we hunting for, we might ask? And the answer is right here, especially that you may prophesy. This word is written in a fashion that says, this is the object of the hunt. The thing that is most useful for the church is prophecy, a speaking forth of the will of God. So verse two, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. All right, think about that for just a moment. If uh, I was amongst a whole group of English speaking people and through miraculous means, which I do not believe take place now, but I came to be able to speak very fluently in, let's say, French, which I could not do today without help, I can promise you. If I begin to speak French in the midst of a whole bunch of English speakers, who's going to benefit? Only God will know what I'm saying. Now, it's true, my spirit may be benefited, but other than that, there's no benefit, no benefit to the church which has assembled for the very purpose of being built up. So he goes on. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort 
to men. Now we're going to quickly see that this word edification is a crucial word in this 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. The word means building up, literally. And it came to mean within the church, building up your brethren, helping each Christian to be stronger in the Lord's service. That's the idea that is here. So prophecies are better able to build up the church since nobody would understand the foreign language that I would be speaking. How much better if I could speak in everybody's language and deliver the message of God? That will be what will both build up and encourage the brethren to do what God wants them to do. So verse 4, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. If I speak in a tongue, I'm really the only one that's benefited by that because I'm the only one within my spirit who understands what I'm saying. But if I prophesy, everybody is built up. Verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive, here's our word again, edification. So listen to what he has to say. He wished that everybody had miraculous gifts, and it'd be wonderful if they could all speak in tongues, because as we will see later, those tongues are perfect for teaching unbelievers the truth. But how much better in the church if everybody could prophesy, because in prophecy there is edification. Now, Paul does give one exception, and the exception is if the man interprets. And the idea of interpretation is that, uh, that whoever does the interpreting intervenes between the tongue speaking and the hearer so that the hearer can understand what is spoken in the tongue. So that would be the exception. If I could both speak in a language miraculously that I'd never studied and I could interpret it, then the brethren could be benefited. But otherwise, the best benefit is, of course, prophecy. So verse 6, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Uh, the tongues were of no benefit in general to the church because in the church, there'd be no one that understood what was being said. But then Paul lists the things that could benefit the church. Every one of them is directed toward helping the members of the church, helping individual Christians understand the will of God. So Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 7, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? Now, in those days, it was common to use a trumpet as a means of directing the troops. For example, the trumpet would sound out, and that would, would suggest it's time to charge the trumpet would sound a different sound, and that would mean join the battle, fight. And then there was yet another sound that meant retreat. Now, what happens if nobody can tell what he's trumpeting? No one knows what the sound means. Did he, did he say charge? Did he, did he say retreat? Uh, are, are we supposed to join the battle? There's total confusion. And Paul is saying that same thing is going to happen in the church. And that's exactly what he goes on to. So likewise, you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. And that's pretty much it, isn't it? Uh, I, I will never be able to forget a, a trip that I made one time. I was invited uh, to come to Nicaragua to speak. Of course, everybody there pretty much spoke 
Spanish. And so here I was, a fellow that, that really doesn't know any Spanish. I do know how to ask about where the bathroom is and, and how to say, uh, you know, hello to you in Spanish, but that's pretty much it. That's all I know. So the brethren very kindly put me in this motel and I almost immediately came to realize that once they left me, I was in trouble because no one could speak English. And so here I was totally in the dark. The truth is that they had a wonderful breakfast buffet. I mean, the likes of which I've never seen anywhere. But I didn't know that it was there for everyone who had a room, that it was included in the cost of the room. And I didn't want to cost the brethren any extra money. So I ate some snacks that I had in the room. Later, <laughs> I was told by someone, no, no, no. That's for you. And you can see where if I don't understand the tongue, then I really don't understand what's going on. And I surely cannot be built up by that. So he continues and he says, there are, it may be so many kinds of languages in the world and none of them was, is without significance. Look, Spanish is an important language to a Spanish speaker. That's the only way he can understand things. If I'm the only one he gets to listen to, then he's got a problem because I can't speak his language. So each language has a value, but the value is to the people who natively speak that language. So he continues, therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Uh, that was the oddest feeling also. One time when I got to go to Guyana, South America, I arrived and guess what line I had to go in to be able to check into the country? I went into the immigrants line. Well, I'm not an immigrant. I'm a citizen of the United States, but not a citizen of Guyana. And that's the point that he's saying here. He's saying uh, we're foreigners to each other. That Spanish speaker is a foreigner to me. And I, because I speak only English, am a foreigner to him. And there's no benefit that comes by our discussion until we find some way to communicate. So verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 14, even so you, since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. And again, remember, Paul is suggesting that the most important thing to do in the church is ultimately to build it up, to build up every member of the church so that we'll all be stronger in the Lord. Verse 13, he continues, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Again, Paul is not saying tongues are just totally bad. If you've got tongues, you are the lowest of the low. That's not his point. His point is that tongues are useful if someone can cause us to understand the sense of what is being said. And so if I'm going to speak in tongues, I need to pray that I can interpret so that everyone else can understand what I am saying. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays but my understanding is unfruitful. So the, the fellow praying in the tongue apparently had some inner sense of what he was praying. But the problem was that nobody else understood it. So how am I going to say amen if I don't understand what the individual praying is saying? What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen, at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? Now, we've already looked at that briefly, but just think about it. We, I may be singing if in those days, if I were inspired to speak in tongues, to sing in other languages, I might be singing, uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. But if the church doesn't understand what I'm singing, then how are they going to 
join in? How are they going to say amen? I may be thanking God for all the marvelous gifts that he gives us in the prayer that I pray, but if it's in a foreign language that nobody understands, how is anyone going to say amen or so be it, or I agree with that? They can't because they do not understand. And that's what Paul is underscoring for the members of the church here. And so he continues uh, as, he, as he says in verse 17, for you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Here we come again. He's not built up. He doesn't really have understanding. And so he goes on, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Nobody in the church in Corinth could speak more languages than the Apostle Paul. Now, that may be in part because he was a well-educated man. We know he spoke Hebrew, for example. We know he spoke Greek. Those things come up rather readily in the book of Acts during the time when the angry mob is, is taking him captive. So we know he had those languages, but apparently he could speak in other languages as well, more than anybody at Corinth, but now listen to him. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words of my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. All right, now look at this and think about it just a minute. Five words. If, if we take the number 10, we would have to divide that in by two to come up with five. So it's in other words, five is half of 10. On the other hand, when we got 10,000 here, we have that equals to 1,000 times 10. So Paul is saying, I'd rather speak with half of 10 in words that people can understand than to speak in 1,000 times 10 words that they cannot understand. That's a pretty potent point that he's making for us. We need to understand the purpose of our assembling is to build up everybody, not to impress everybody with what I've been empowered to do, but instead to build up everyone. And though we do not have the miraculous gifts today, we should have as a goal to build up the church. So in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, Paul continues, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. Brethren, do not be children. The way that's written in the original language, it, it literally describes stop doing that. <laughs> they were acting like children in reference to uh, these gifts and, and to the idea of understanding. They were like children being drawn to the prettiest gift. You ever notice something? When a, when a whole bunch of gifts are before a child, they may open up just one and start to play with the, with the bow because the bow is the prettiest thing. They don't even pay attention to what the gift is. It's just the bow that they're interested in. Paul is saying... You folks need to stop being like children, interesting in what looks the best to you. And you need to focus on the idea of understanding. Now, do you want to know what Paul says we ought to be children in? He says, be children in malice. Have you ever noticed that, again, children uh, don't really have a problem with grudges? I think back to my childhood. I got to go visit... Uh, in uh, Michigan with my grandparents and also my cousins. I was particularly close to one cousin, uh, Larry. He and I would play together all the time. We'd either be at his house, or we'd be at grandma's house all the time. Well, this particular day we were at grandma's house. And I don't remember what happened, but, but we got into an argument. And he got so mad, he said, I'm just going home. Forget it, I don't wanna be with you anymore. And he stormed out. Well, of course, I, I started to cry. Grandma came up to me and said, uh, Gary, don't worry about it. He, he'll, he'll forget and, and he'll be back. Well, not too long after that, 
I heard a bell, a constant ringing bell. I thought, that's, that's odd. I, I don't know what that bell is. It was off in the distance. Next thing I know, here comes Larry running down the street. Hey, hey, they, they've robbed the, the store up here and, and that's the alarm going off. And let's, let's pretend we're the police and let's see if we can chase down those folks. Well, you see, children don't hold grudges very long. So Paul says, don't be a child when it comes to things that matter in terms of understanding, but be a child when it comes to grudges. Put them down. Put them away. Readily forgive. That will benefit the church. So in verse 21, he says, in the law, it is written with men of other tongues and other lips. I will speak to this people and yet for all that, they will not hear me. Of course, that's Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12. And what he's anticipating is that Israel is going to be conquered by Assyria. And they're not going to speak the language of the Assyrians. And so they will be instructed effectively by the Assyrians. God's going to speak through the Assyrians to deliver a message to Israel. Of course, that message is you need to listen to God. That's the real message of their conquest, of the defeat and being carried off like they were, but they're not going to understand. Why? Because the Assyrians don't speak in a language they understand. Now, Paul uses that point from the Old Testament and brings it over into the New Testament church. And what he says here is very, very powerful. And that is you cannot really understand the will of God if the person speaking to you is speaking in a language you do not understand. So tongues, remember chapter 12, it was at the bottom of two lists. And there's a reason for that. Because in the church, it's not the most beneficial gift. So verse 22, therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. When you go out to teach people in foreign lands, well, tongues are very valuable. Wouldn't it have been a blessing if I could have been miraculously empowered to speak Spanish without having ever studied it? I, I would have loved to have been able to do that. I cannot. God doesn't do that anymore. But if I could, I could use that to teach others what they need to know about the gospel of Christ. But in the church, in the church, I need to tell forth, speak forth the will of God. So verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 14, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Well, boy, wouldn't that be the case? If you're over here speaking French, which by the way, I don't understand, and somebody else over here speaking German, which by the way, I don't understand, and somebody else is over here speaking Spanish, and you already know I don't understand that, and another fellow speaking Italian, and yet another is speaking uh, maybe Portuguese, with all these various languages being spoken all at the same time, what sense does it make? We sound like a bunch of crazy people because nobody is communicating with anybody and the unbeliever would readily see that, but then watch. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. Now pause a minute and remember that they're, they're in a particular city. Of course, in Corinth, most everybody spoke Greek. Maybe everybody did. And so if everybody's prophesying, they're all telling forth the will of God. Then when an unbeliever comes in, they hear something that makes sense, something that will build up the church. And because they hear something that will build up the church, they hear also the truth and it can cause them to be convicted. Listen to the 25th verse. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. When all of us tell forth the will of God, then hearts are revealed. And that's been a remarkable thing that I've seen 
in preaching, not just my preaching, any, any preacher that is clear in presenting the will of God is going to have people come out and say, man, I felt like you'd been right there walking with me in my daily life. I felt like you'd been in our living room and on, on they will go. The point is the word of God is so written and so designed that it hits home to every man. So when these unbelievers come in and they hear prophecy, the telling forth of the will of God, then at that point, they come to realize I'm a sinner and I need to change my life. And wouldn't that be a glorious thing to have happen? Now, Paul goes from that to begin to talk about their meetings and in a more particular way. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, that all things be done for edification. Now, let's remember that everybody did not have the same gift. We've already seen those lists of gifts, and they were different, weren't they? Some prophesied, they spoke forth the will of God. Some were miraculous teachers, and they would explain what God wanted us to do with our lives. Others were tongue speakers, and and those tongue speakers, if they had an interpreter with them, could, could say something else that needed to be said. But when we come together, we need to realize that all these various gifts have one purpose in the church. And that one purpose in the church is that everybody can be built up. How many times have we seen that word? Let's see. Go back, verse 3. We have the word edification, build up. In, in the next verse, we have the word edify, which is a form of edification, building up. We have it in verse 5, edification. Verse 12, edification of the church. You can go on down and you'll see that word edify again as you go on through. And now here we are again, verse 26, we have edification. So what is the primary point that Paul has been driving home in these opening 25 or 26 verses of 1 Corinthians 14. And the obvious answer is, whatever we do when we come together as the people of God, it ought to be so designed and so carried out so that everybody will be built up. After all, remember chapter 12? We're a body. My hands are very useful to the feeding of my, of my body. I use them to feed, to eat. In the same way, every member of the church needs to be useful for the building up of the church. <laughs>